welcome Catherine and Jonathan. Very, very, very excited to have you both on the Lanfrica Talks. Real quick to introduce you to our audience. If you could, how would you describe yourselves in one phrase? I think each of you. I'll start. Um, I consider myself a pracademic. I've always uh, wanted to take academic theory and work with it in a very practical manner. Um, my day job is on enabling OER in under-resourced schools and in terms of legislative and policy changes that support OER. And like Jonathan, I'm a very active member of Creative Commons. That's that's a wonderful pracademic. That's a new word, right? Because I, it's not something <laughs> that I've ever heard. A, a lady in intelligence called herself a pracademic, and I thought that was just such a fabulous way of describing somebody who moves between theory and pra practice. Yeah. Uh, because to me, if if theory doesn't lead to practice, then what are we what are we doing? And if we don't think deeply about our practice, then again, what are we doing? Yeah, that's 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 very profound. I'm gonna keep that if you don't mind, pracademic. And and what about you, Jonathan? Well, that's it's so much fun to hear Catherine describe things that herself that way. I I guess I um my training is as a pure mathematician, so exactly the other completely impractical. Um, and I I spent um I spent what I like to say is about a hundred thousand years, at least when you write it base two, um, uh, teaching and doing research in mathematics and computer science. Um, in a whole bunch of different universities and research institutes, but I sort of accidentally have become more practical. In recent years, I'm working with the Creative Commons. As Catherine mentions, we both work with the Creative Commons quite a bit, and I've become a bit of a, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but I've become a little bit of an expert in intellectual property. And um, But I like to think uh, that my uh, what I can do to be useful in the world these days is I like reading technical things, and I like te teaching about them and explaining them, and maybe I can be useful to the community particularly people like the Creative Commons community, by explaining some of the technology in a way that lets them come to the conclusions that they want to do with a more, with sort of a better, more solid foundation when thinking about some of these things. So that's that's the task I've been setting myself in the last few years. I used to be in the United States, but now I live in Italy. That's wonderful. Uh, it's very interesting to see a expert in mathematics turn to expert in intellectual property and the things that you mentioned. So we have two, two of you have very unique um, stories and background and where you're coming from. How did you two meet and get to be working together on these things? That's a simple uh, question. I, uh, I realized that I knew nothing about open education resources and the funder for a project in Germany was very intent on it. And the more I looked into it, the less I knew. And then I discovered that there was a thing called the Creative Commons Certificate Course for Educators, and I enlisted, and Jonathan was my facilitator. So it's it's from him that I learned all about the intellectual property and specifically copyright. And we've and what's that we just we just struck it up and we've been working together ever since. Yes, Catherine's kind of an unstoppable force. Once once we work together for the Creative Commons course, then she I was always contacting me and saying, Hey, let's do this thing and, and it's it's so much fun and, and has expanded my world enormously. So I'm always happy to work with her. That's really wonderful. Uh, that's a really almost a perfect match. So so two of you met working around the intersection of Creative Commons. Could you tell us more about what you do at Creative Commons? Well, so I'm not officially an employee of Creative Commons. I they're they're very, very small organizations. It's interesting, you know, Wikipedia is used by millions of people across the world, and every single page on Wikipedia has a Creative Commons copyright license on it. The organization that created and shepherds the Creative Commons licenses, Creative Commons is tiny. It has, I think, fewer than 18 um, employees at the moment. Um, and um, anyway, but they do they do bring in some experts, people who train up with them to help them facilitate the, this online training course, which is called the Creative Commons Certificate. Um, and we, I took the course and then I trained to be a facilitator and I have facilitated by now 50, I counted the other day, I facilitated 15 sections of this online course with 311 students from um, 25 American states and about 24 uh, other countries around the world. I've gotten every continent except Antarctica. 
And if someone from McMurdo Station in Antarctica ever signs up for the course, I really want to be facilitator for that course. I will have covered every continent on the planet. Um, but you know, Creative Commons is a is a volunteer is a aside from this very small group of employees, it's an organization that tries to um, facilitate people sharing information without the bat the restrictions of copyright or you know to have more fine-tuned control over what restrictions of coming from copyright law that they want to use for their own work and um you know they there are lots of people who volunteer their time Catherine I think you're now the the president of the South African chapter of the Creative Commons there are many country chapters and they have people who work and I think Catherine is the president of the Creative Commons entirely volunteer organization in South Africa to support work the Creative Commons does in that area it's called the chapter lead. And again, it's unremunerated. It's a purely voluntary position, right? And I think that for me, I've just been reading Braiding Sweetgrass, which is in a wonderful book. And what we are, what both Jonathan and I are really concerned about is that the commons is a place where you openly share. You choose to openly share other things in the, in the public domain, or from an open education perspective, you wanting to ensure that people are able to retain, reuse, redistribute, revise and remix materials. Because especially in countries like Africa, resources are very, very expensive. So you're wanting to make it accessible. So the people who are drawn to this world are the people who are wanting to openly share, who are wanting the openness. Um, and our real concern with things like AI is that we see that the commons may become polluted, adulterated, that you now will be basically, it's just that you can spam. You know, AI is kind of spamming as a service. It's sort of man spamming as a service. And all of the things, all of the values that are embedded and open around being just, being equitable, being sustainable, are being eroded by a kind of a wholesale sort of, train ride into um, enabling a ve very few already extraordinarily um, profitable enterprises to become even more profitable. Um, and yet, you know, doing it in terms of th there's this underlying thesis that, oh, this is going to be good for us, that it's going to open things, open access, open education. But in fact, our reflections are that very often it does the opposite. I see. And I think that brings us into the next um, topic, which is AI, or as you call it, a ain't. Well, I, I was just thinking, you know, that the there are these terminologies seem so important, you know, if like in the United States, politics is, you know, is it pro-choice or pro-life? The way you call something, the name you use for something seems to matter. And Catherine is always pointing out that, you know, that calling it the cloud, um, the computer networks, the cloud seems to make them pure and puffy and clean and floating out there in space. But that's not the reality of the data centers that use power and, and clean water and so on. And similarly, I think the idea of artificial intelligence, I think it was it's Kate Crawford, whose book Atlas of AI says that the problem with the phrase artificial intelligence is that what we call AI today is neither artificial, nor is it intelligent. And so I was looking for another um, Another way to talk about it. And so it's sort of another, sometimes when you make a short, uh, you know, an acronym, you shorten the words. And so you could take artificial intelligence, say A, A, and then I N I N T, just take the I N T from intelligence. And then you get ain't, which is the the contraction of is not, at least in a colloquial American English. And so it's, it's a sort of, uh, so I pronounce it ain't. It's a sort of way of talking a little, bringing people's attention to maybe it doesn't do. It's a more negative sort of sounding word that maybe it doesn't do. It, it you know, in colloquial American English, you'd say that ain't what you know. It ain't what people say it is, right? And and this is a way of saying it. it it's not. It does not do what maybe what what it's promised to do. So we've been calling it ain't. I particularly like um, generative AI. You see the phrase a lot, and so I use. When I talk on social media, I call Gen Ain't, you know, generative artificial intelligence, but with that sort of contraction to Gen Ain't. That's that's lovely. So tell us more about Ain't. What inspired you to put out this 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 video, this presentation, talking about what AI ain't? Uh, the one of both Jonathan and I had worked on the ethics of open sharing with uh, the Creative Commons, one of the platform groups, um, and that was really reflecting on the values. 
Um, and that Creative Commons had also come up with a concept of better sharing based on surveys within the group. And that says that better sharing is contextual, it's inclusive, it's just, it's equitable, it's reciprocal, and it's sustainable. And we felt that it was a very useful and, and conceptual framework within which to start saying, all right, what is AINT? And does AINT do what, we, what we're what we expecting to, it to do? And because it gave us that, um, yeah, as I said, we could then map and say, is it inclusive? And the answer is no. Is it just? No. Is it so, But it also gave us a, a a starting point from which to talk about the various the various categories. Um, and certainly by the end, in fact, there wasn't a single category in which AINT is better um, or doesn't have serious issues. And I mean, the one that Jonathan already talked about is ChatGPT. They say it uses 500 milliliters, so half a liter of water per chat and enough energy to power up a cell phone. And currently in America, Georgia is suddenly discovering because it became a state where data warehouses were, were, were told to come, their data projections are 17, one seven times more than they're expecting. And the problem with that is you end up with an unjust transition because if these big data companies have signed off long-term contracts, as happened in South Africa when energy was cheap, you find that the ordinary taxpayer or resident now starts having to subsidize and pay for the cost of electricity because these long-term contracts are in place. And that's a very unjust transition and also totally unsustainable. I mean, Sam Altman said the quiet part out loud the other day. He said that we have to come up with a new source of energy. I mean... They're looking, Virginia's looking, I mean, they're going to need to build a few more nuclear power stations to keep up with the demand of the data centers. Um, and that's that, that's that's just one of the issues. And I know Jonathan has a lot of others. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I, I just think the sort of, the kind of, the thing I like about sort of focusing on the a negative kind of contraction is to make people stop and think, you know, some of the things that you you hear about in this field these days are, are very exciting and they sound wonderful. And there's always, we're going to, it's going to be a revolutionary change in technology. And if that were true and it would, if it could be done, as Catherine just mentioned, sustainably and equitably and fairly and respectfully, um, that would be wonderful. And I would be happy to, for, to, to usher in the new, the new millennium, but it seems like um, the negatives are so strong that people need to stop for a second and think, did I just hear that? You know, so as a, uh, the, the CEO of OpenAI, which is not an open organization, although they, they use that, na that name, but um, you know they don't open source any of their codes. It's not, it's not an open organization. I don't know why, how they, anyway, you know, he said, was, he, was it at Davos this year? He said he needs $7 trillion of investment in the AI industry in the next decade or something. It's like, he's trillion with a T, you know, that's a, that's a, that's an ins un unimaginably large amount of money. And one of the things he wants to use, you know, two trillion of that to, to develop viable fusion power, because so much power is going to be needed to drive the data centers, as Catherine was just mentioning, that the current grid won't support it. And so, oh, it's just a side, it's a parenthetical little so homework task that some of his engineers will do to make viable fusion power to power this new, um, in, 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 this new AI based industry. And it, he he literally stood up in front of the press and said he wants seven trillion dollars, which, you know, is you've got you know people and people seem to t react as if that makes that that's a thing we should be talking about rationally. That's a that's an irrational amount thing to ask for. That's you know, the U.S. government budget is two trillion dollars a year. You know how can, how can you talk about multiples of the budget of of one you know the, of a rich superpower as as a reasonable amount of money to spend for some particular niche. Uh, industrial endeavor. So I, I think it's nice to think about, I really want people to stop and think and, and ask, does any of that make sense? I think the other thing was I was looking at the tiny amount, I mean, in order for Africa to transition from a sustainability point of perspective, it needs X amount. Um, I can't remember the exact figure, but they, they got 
the amount required has been spent on Google and Amazon and all the rest, building these data centers, investing in AI. Why are we not investing in the planet? I mean, why are not we not investing in, you know, ecosystems and water resources and all the rest? But that all does seems to be neither here nor there. But this is the new big, whatever, tulip economy, you know, uh, a place where you can make the new NFT, the place where you can make lots of money on the stock exchange. Um, um, but the question is, oh, what are we what are we actually doing? And I think the other thing that we've been really concerned about in terms of your large language models, um, they called large language models. They don't fit with with countries which have small language data sets. So even if you're wanting to do a translation, if you've got Isi Kosa, for instance, it's I mean, we found even when working with an elementary school that the data that is up there just simply isn't big enough. You know, the amount of data, the number of texts that have been scanned and whatever. And the question isn't, you know, oh, yes, okay, so now we must remedy it. Um, and then what, just get lots of people, who's going to pay for that? I mean, there's no money for, all, you know, ordinary people doing it. But the other question is that, you know, your divides just get bigger and bigger because if you're relying on some kind of translation mechanism, then, you know, you're just going to find it's, you know, the haves and the have-nots and the haves get more and more and the have-nots get less and less. Because, and, and it really worries me that, you know, that world languages are at risk. You know, they've been at risk for a long time, but anybody who grows up with a particular language and a point of view and a culture, I mean, I was just reading in Braiding Sweetgrass how in, in your... Native American, you had the you don't have a sense of female or male, but you have a sense of animate or inanimate, and rocks are animate, and water is animate. There's very little. In fact, inanimate is people made. That's a whole worldview, that is, and a whole value system and a whole ethical system that is embedded in language. And currently, they've got none fluent speakers left. You know, and this is again, is that equi is that inclusive? Is it equitable? Is it reciprocal? I mean, if we all just become native English speakers, or what you know, how much more will the world lose? To your point, Catherine, about languages that are being that are endangered. Mm. So, so and and how they they have this rich culture. Some would say that this is where the role of digitization and maybe AI could help sort of preserving these languages and that's what some you know love organizations like meta and the rest are working on and how to preserve languages and i think when it comes to ai in african languages the african researchers are more in tune with that direction of how do we preserve our languages and our culture through ai so what do you think about that that seems like a potentially good use of ai Potentially, yes. My, my worry, though, and we see it in South Africa and I'm sure in other places where I think it was in Ghana, where I think your primary language of instruction in education is English, is that you do, you will, from a cultural perspective, just get parents saying, you know what, the predominant language is English and most of the texts are there and that's your it, it, gets you entry into various universities in America or whatever, that you do see those shifts happening. Um, and that just, you know, saying, I, I don't know that it can be, um, it's kind of a bit like a gold rush. Everybody's rushing for the gold and, you know, the people are like taking too long to get there or just taking too long to get there. I don't really see a systemic and very careful and very thought through approach in terms of that. And I don't think just throwing in, like getting more and more text and uh, I mean, what are you going to do? Just throw in more text? Are you going to look at the copyright of the text? And I think that's another thing that Jonathan's been and I've been looking at that in many instances, we see that, that the copyright has not been adhered to in terms of your data sets, your input sets. So if you take a poet or a or a writer and you put their text in for the training set, are you violating copyright? And Jonathan's the um, expert in terms of the copyright around that, and that because that's another question. Because if that's what you're doing, are you are, are you fixing the problem, the one problem, by creating another set of problems? 
I mean, also if I could jump in, I think I think it's I, I totally agree with Kevin. I, I I think that we sometimes hear these proposed a sort of sort of sweet spot of marvelously positive, socially positive applications of artificial intelligence. You know, so I, I would love if we had tools, technological tools that would help us preserve cultures that have smaller populations that are losing, you know, that are, are losing, you know, they're afraid that cult their cultural traditions, their language will be swamped by all of the, you know, trashy English stuff coming out of the United States and so on. And I, that I, would love if AI were a great tool for that. And maybe it is a tool in some context, but I think you have to look carefully at these to sort of name a problem and then say, oh, and by the way, AI is going, AI is going to solve this problem. You know, I want to hear the details there, you know, because many times the details aren't really, you know, so as, as Catherine was saying, where are we going to get the text? You know, if we want, if there's a language that's a, spoken by a very small population compared to the rest of the internet, and we want to save it. So how we, you know, or keep people, the people, a thriving community, community that uses that as their primary language, keep them participating in the global uh, global network. Well, by how firing up trans automatic translation. And I think large language models make for better translation. Uh, that's an, an application which I don't particularly argue with, although the sustainability is something we need to think about. But, you know, I mean, I use, autom I live in a country now where my native, my native language is not the language that's spoken on the street. I speak pretty good Italian, but I, when I write a formal letter, I run it through some LLM to get a tra an Italian version. But then I find myself, even though Italian is, there's, there are thousands of, you know, there are gigabytes of Italian literature, which is in, has been translated. So those are, our language, um, corpora can be used to train translation between English and Italian. Still, I have never once ever used a an automatically generated text without editing it heavily before I use it. So I want to ask you, so you, the, the proposal that you were making, well, we're going to save languages that are spoken by smaller populations that are getting swamped in the current uh, international internet. Are there enough texts? Are there enough native speakers who, who can correct all of those translation to make high quality translations? And is it going to really keep those, keep those languages alive? Or is it going to continue to sort of to sort of uh, corrupt them and produce poor translations, which make you know great works of literature and languages that are not known by the global population that would be worth worth knowing, are going to be translated into something that 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 seems like it's you know um, you know advertising jingles, and so will no, will not get the get the advantage that it should, the attention that it should. So I think I think we have to be aware. You know, every time I hear a sort of utopian, oh, we could use it for this wonderful use. I like the use. And if it's a if it's a technical tool that we are comfortable using despite some of the negative consequences, I'm happy about that. But let's please tell me the details of that. It, you know, similar, you know, Catherine and I both work in education, and and you know, people are always saying, oh, there are under resourced schools around the world. Wouldn't it be great if everyone had a personal tutor? Well, they're not going to have a personal tutor, but maybe we'll have an AI tutor that will a chatbot tutor. You know, I was a teacher for for as I said, 100,000 years base two in my life. And, I, you know, I interacted with my students as one-to-one. -one. You know, it was my action as a teacher Teacher was not something that could be automated. I don't, I don't think it could be automated. So the problem of not having enough teachers is not one which admits a simple solution. Oh, let's just hand them all the chat GPT, right? That, you know, that's not a solution. And similarly, I think you're, you're making a very good point that, that we want to preserve diverse cultures. If, LMs were a solution of preserving diverse cultures. I'd be all for them. I just don't think they are. Is the details that matter? Because and a lot of the you know for it's for branding and everything. We always like to use these big terms that always sound sound nice and sound good. But the detail is where the the, the work comes in. And for example, a lot of the work that I've been doing around something like language preservation for African languages, we've always come to this conclusion, where are we, why are we using text? There are many African languages that were not even built on text. They, they're f fully on acoustic medium. And then it, it, it changes the way we look at AI. Why is everything text-based? You know, Why can't we work more on the acoustic medium and try to do that? And it then brings up new research fields and, and helps us venture into different areas. So, I mean, we've, I've also had discussions with many African researchers about how, what is the way to actually approach 
language preservation for African languages in a meaningful way. And that could change if you're trying to do language preservation in another continent. You, know, you have to come from the point of view of understanding the language, understanding the culture, understanding the history, then figuring out the the places where you could help with technology and not just the standard approach which is just put technology on that, just wrap it with technology and whatever to fix itself. Well, and can I ask you a follow-up question? I, it seems like I, I love I love that perspective you give it. And are you comfortable with the if there were technological solutions, as you point out, maybe interesting research being done in you know acoustic media as opposed to purely text based? Would you be comfortable if this great important work of preserving languages and cultures were being done were being done by a very extractive, highly profit oriented co companies based in Silicon Valley. I mean, shouldn't it be done no, by no. Yeah, I mean <laughs> exactly shouldn't it be done by the, I, yeah. the cultures themselves and and you know yes, exactly. how can we, yeah. Yeah. The, the, so, the, the cultures themselves should have a should have a it's not just even a, a thing of having a stake, you know, they should be involved. In, in it and it's not involved as in come and I'll pay you to be an intern but they should be involved in even the major decisions around the way exactly that driving it yes in the driver's yeah. seat absolutely the other um the other thing that I'm particularly interested in and it's for me or it's certainly the most I don't know if they the most blatant but they certainly visual visual media always makes you stop in your tracks. And in the presentation, we looked at how you know AI generated vision visuals can be almost identical to the original that was inputted. Um, so, and then we were looking at some of the Aboriginal sort of dreamings. Uh, you know, with the it was a way of mapping where water sources and all the rest. So it was all supposed to be entirely sacred and entirely private. It would be kept within a community. Um, and you then you found that they've been used and you can get AR generated images. We didn't even use those in the in the presentation because the bottom line is that if these works were meant to be kept sacred in terms of their original context, um, and I certainly could not find a single one that had been licensed by any original artist. What I did find was a picture of something in a museum which somebody had put on. But then you find that some of your software packages, your graphics packages, have now created simulacrums, really, of what they are. But the question is, again, from a contextual point of view, from a religious, from an ethical, from a spiritual point of view, is this an an maybe an egregious use of of you know all images can just go into the machine they just they all just grist to the mill you know out comes the sausage and is this is this an acceptable use you know also there's been a lot of with the whole image generation thing you know different there's also scary use cases right because I mm. think what the world is really I don't know if the word is, you know, I don't want to slowly understanding or maybe trying to understand but not address it fully, especially when it comes to AI. Is this is a very delicate technology that you're just releasing? I like the thing you said. I think Catherine, where you said a, a thought through process, where you you really thought about different aspects of the technology that you're working on, not trying to focus on only one side or just the positives and the negatives. No, I'm not looking there because I don't want to be pessimistic or also just focusing on the pessimistic because no, I want to be like that, but really a well-round thought out process. And I think that's something that AI has even till now has still not had. It's um, on the good side, it's ongoing um, different aspects are springing up. Like when it comes to data and data sovereignty and, um, what you said, Jonathan, about the community driving the process. We have some good stories on the African continent of Masakane, for example. On the, uh, We have the Maori that really made the Maori community that 
kind of said, this is our community, this is our data, this is what we're going to do with our data, this is what you can and cannot do with our data, right? So there are some good stories, but it, it still needs to be this really well-rounded, thought-out process. And sadly, a lot of hype and media attention is going to the West and the global north, where, where it should be also distributed to the other places. But I guess that's part of what we're doing in this podcast, you know, shedding light on some of these other important aspects of Inked. Um, one, one question before the, the other question. In the beginning, we said how people are not listening to the negatives of AI. And I, I feel that personally, because as a researcher, when I enter debates with non, when I enter debates with, with people who are not researchers, but whose lives what I'm doing are affecting. So the fact that they are not researchers, they, they clearly don't see AI from my point of view. I think I'm more of a, what could be, well, let's try and do that, you know, but I meet people who, some are not even interested in AI. They're trying to, you know, maybe have a means of substance or they're interested in something else. My, my question to, to both of you, from your experience, what do you think are some of the reasons why people are not listening? I'm going to jump in and then I'm going to hand over to Jonathan. So one of the reasons that I love doing this work with Jonathan was because he is a mathematician and a statistician and a programmer. So nobody can say, oh, but you don't understand how the technology works. You know, no one can. What's it? RT's playing, playing him, right? Um, and I think. You know, it's a bit like at one stage, everybody, including your your massage therapist, was an expert on quantum physics, right? Um, you know, it was like, and like you, God forbid, you, you actually said, I don't understand how it works. Like, how does it work? What 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 is this thing, right? Because it was almost like you're gonna have you're gonna put a badge of stupidity or an elbow loose in your forehead if you say, hey, I I, I really don't get it, right? So it's, there's almost like a, an intellectual race to at least pretend that you know it. You see, and I think that's part of it, that when you've been on top of that, you've got a layer of salesmen or salespeople coming in and saying it's the best thing since fast bread, it's going to solve the world's problems and so on. And so, and so uh, marketers and showmen, you kind of, you, you, it's nobody's prepared to say maybe the emperor isn't wearing any clothes. And that's where Jonathan comes in, uh, handing over to you. Yeah, I, I, I told so much. Thank you, Catherine. I really, I, I have found this very, a very frustrating experience because I, I spend a lot of time, you know, when Catherine and I talked about speaking at the Creative Commons event that you mentioned before that the, it was the event in Mexico City in October. And we had talked about, well, oh, we should present something there. And I thought I can read those papers. I will read a hundred papers of computer science and I will, I will understand what's going on. I will go to webinars. You know, there are, there are a dozen webinars a day from all over the world that you can go to about this or that new technical advance. And I will, um, as you know, the, I don't know if you know of this, uh, there's a group called the mystery AI hype theater. It's a, it's another podcast focused particularly on AI. It's run by Emily Bender and Alex Hanna, um, uh, two scholars who do a wonderful job. And they're always talking about always check the footnotes is one of their, their sort of sayings. And so I figured I can read the papers and check the footnotes. And I've actually found you don't even have to read the footnotes, just read the papers. The papers don't say what the PR about the papers says. Um, and and so it's, you know, you go back to like, I think it was Cicero who said, you know, cui bono, to, who, to whom is this a benefit? Right. When someone takes a, an exciting new computer science advancement, you know, transformers are nice technology. I like them. I'm not I'm not I'm not against technology. I like the technology. I just think that when someone says I have a great new way of, you know, making slightly better statistical, good sounding collections of, of tokens, likely like statistically likely sequences of tokens, as we say in computer science. I'm happy to read that paper when they say that they're going to change the economy of the world and they're going to produce you know, they're going to be able to tutor students in under-resourced communities and we're going to get one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is as high quality as as as, as the best um, experienced human tutor. Or when they're going to, you know, they're going to cure cancer or they're going to uh, be able to identify cancers in x-rays better than ever before. Some of those tasks they'll be able to do, some they won't. They should be clear about what they actually are doing. And so I find it 
there is the people who are talking about the benefits of this are mostly people who stand to profit from the benefit of it. And and I, it makes me very nervous. As we said about preserving technology, we want this in the hands of profit-seeking organizations. I think there's one additional wrinkle, which is kind of funny, which is that humans seem to like to see kind of uh, minds in other in other things around them, um, you know, obviously in other humans, but also in you know the, in in natural events, you know the 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 Greeks thought there were spirits in the trees, and many cultures have you know, and, and Catherine was mentioning that the rocks are animate in certain in certain cultures. I think you know we we have been programmed for a long time by our culture, different cultures around the world, to think of you know it's a mind it, it it it's like a mind it could have potentially you know a, an inanimate thing that could potentially have a mind and then we've been programmed by modern literature and art and movies and so on you know how many you know how 9000 from the 2001 movie and you know the terminator movies from the uh, you know, and there's so many Hollywood movies in which AI has this incredible power and so it's very we're very ready to see that when when you know when um 60 uh, scholars of AI research write a paper saying, we have to stop research right away because we're in danger of creating an intelligence that will take over the world. You know, we'll have some exponential growth of its ability to control the world. And in two minutes, before anyone really realizes it will become super intelligent and it will turn us all into paper clips. That seems to be the nightmare everyone has, that someone will have typed in, make me more paper clips, and the AI will become superhuman in a fraction of a second and will just turn us all into paper clips. And you know, I think that's a kind of scary image, and it fits with so many stories we've been told. Frankenstein's story, and you know, and the you know, um, Hephaestus, the Greek god of fire, had made made robots in the in Greek myths from two thousand years ago, twenty five hundred years ago. Hephaestus had robots that had sort of agency and could help him. And we we've been we've been programmed by our cultures to believe that these things might have agency, and so they don't. You know, you're you're a technical person. You know that you know it's not like the computer does things. It's you type a command and you hit enter, and then it does something. You know, it it, it has no agency whatsoever. And so, um, I think we have been programmed by culture to uh, to to give it more credit than it is due. I, yeah, it's it's beautiful technology, but someone's got to type run enter before it does something, and and um, we need to stop believing that the Hollywood movies were um, we were describing something that's going to be happening tomorrow if we're not careful. Well, no, just to summarize, I, I think that you and others had looked at it and decided there was no there there, as as it were. You know, the, the, and yet now you come across and they're salesmen, or salespeople, and on top of that, you've also now got all this anthropomorphization. Ah, it's a long word, um, but it basic, you know, that 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 now computers are being given all these human attributes, including intelligence. And one of the things that we did go back and look at was Alan Turing's original paper called The Imitation Game. I think it's 1952, um, from which he never uses the term artificial intelligence in it, interestingly enough. Um, and like any good philosopher, he says, okay, if there's a computer and it were to imitate a human, what are the characteristics it needs? Including one of them is natural language processing, but another one is the capacity to understand humor. And I've never seen an AI with a sense of humor. I mean, because that is a uniquely, I mean, that that, that requires all kinds of um I wouldn't even say agency. It's it's a texture. It's a nuance. It's I mean that that's truly human like or at least um, and yet. So if you actually look at what has been solved, it's been some of the you know the capacity to play chess, the capacity to understand language, but then there are very many um, of those tasks that he said a computer would have to do um, in order to imitate a human that have actually failed. Um, and yet, despite that, we are attributing um, human qualities. But again, the bottom line is who is who is profiting? And it's just those same very few hyper-rich uh, companies that are just getting extraordinary amounts of money in order to create more energy 
inefficient data set. I mean, you are sure, you know, you can offset, but you've still got two power sources. You're still working on fossil fuels, and now you're generating, you know, so-called green energy on the side, but you're not actually offsetting. I mean, the one doesn't cancel the other, right? You still got all of this vertically integrated energy center going using gigawatts. I mean, I think Georgia, I was, I was just looking at it, um, in 2022 in the US, they were thinking they're needing 221 gigawatts. And by 2023, it's gone up to 563 gigawatts. Why? Because of that was a recent Washington Post article just saying that the American energy grid is just not not able to cope with the demands of all these data centers. Um, it simply cannot cope. And um, and to get back to the open AI, Jonathan, it's interesting Elon Musk is now suing them because they've turned from being a nonprofit to which he gave 44 US million dollars into a for-profit enterprise without it seems uh, changing their deed or anything. So they may they may very well be in violation of the, I don't know, I mean, I don't know American law that well, but they certainly were originally set up as a non-profit. And it seems to have been that this technology has been, and that lots of people were experimenting with behind the scenes. Once it was unleashed, everyone's just gotten into an arms race. Let's see how, you know, how quickly we can deploy our aimed as opposed to saying well you know as with the original arms race maybe we should think very carefully about how many nuclear weapons we actually produce thinking very carefully is not something i imagine it's something i imagine researchers or technologists doing but it's not something i imagine politicians or profit seeking or or people capitalists mind of thinking it's always break things and you know going for us cause some dissonance there and then learn from it and ask for forgiveness later. So it's, it's, it's the, yeah, it's, it's quite, it's quite sad. But to your point, Jonathan, about, I like what you said, you know, if you talk about transformers, the thing, the footnotes and all the details, it's there in the research paper. But if you look at the, the marketing, you know, it's oh, it could would it would be used to you to be your new your new therapist. It would be this, be, and those marketings never have the footnotes. They never go into details. And I also like your point that humans seem to like that. We like this mystical thing that will do this wonderful thing, and it, it's nice for us, and it's also nice for the marketers. I I personally think, and I wanted to get your opinion. I personally think there's a kind of a dichotomy between science and non-science because as a researcher when we talk about some things like the harms of ai or some of the the the, the problems we tend to approach it from a scientific pro we have a scientific process right you, there's these there's steps hypothesis and you do you formulate your your hypothesis very well. You do some experiment, right? There's a whole process to it, and then you also try to document that so that everyone else can really see the fine grain details. But marketing, on the other hand, it's it's the more vague you are, the better. The more hype and brand you put to things, the better. And I, I kind of feel like AI went from being you know, when it when when AI was purely in the research field, people were just purely on based on research. It was something different than what it is now, mostly because you have a lot of more market branding, profit seeking, as you call it. But you know, it it's not research purely anymore. There are other elements that have come to it, and that's partly why it's shrouded in purposely shrouded in mystery especially when it comes to its applications that affect humans. I mean, I, can I just say, I I, I, th I really, I, I, I love the, 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 the thing you're thinking about. I, I think I'm not quite as optimistic as you are. I mean, I think, I mean, I realize you're describing a somewhat dark scenario, sort of a, a problematic scenario. So I don't know that it, it makes sense to really call it optimistic, but I think um, it reminds me a little bit of what happened with the whole blockchain world. I mean, I, when I, I worked for, uh, I've been an academic, but I've also worked in industry for a while. And I worked in IBM research and I did some work 
in the early part of this millennium on the tech, the cryptography that's related that became blockchains. And so, you know, I wrote a few papers that then are referenced by all the people writing about blockchains. And I was, I was really interested when this technology came out. I thought, well, you know, hey, this doesn't do what the people who are making PR about it say it does. It does something very nice, but it doesn't do what you say it does. And I, my feeling was it was all going to be a lot of hype that was going to dry up and blow away. And all that would be left behind would be that the general public or the the computer public using public would have a little bit more understanding of some basic things from cryptography. You know, what does it, what does it mean to make a digital signature on something, something like that? It turned out it blew away. And many of the people who used to work for blockchain companies now work in AI startup companies, or at least the management people are very some the same people, but it didn't leave behind any residue, helpful residue of knowledge of cryptology. It left behind nothing. No one got I mean, I don't think the general public understands more about digital signatures or hash chains or things like that than they did before this industry, you know, just sort of died as it has been slowly dying lately. And I think the same thing is true about um, AI. You know, AI are very nice statistical models. As someone who has done and taught statistics, I love statistical models. They make me very happy. And if if when this whole thing dries up and blows away and doesn't and doesn't change the world the way everyone keeps it, if we're left with a little deeper understanding, if the general public is a little under deeper understanding of statistical models, that would be great. I'm not optimistic anymore. I don't think people are having those conversations that will that will leave a deeper understanding. Um, I think I think. Um, and I think uh, so. so I'm a little pessimistic on the general public getting getting useful out of it. I'm also a little bit pessimistic about the the thing you were saying. I think it's a really great, you know, scientific the scientific method has been has made the world a better place. You know, the vaccines are good. We should not, you know, we should and you know, and clean water is good. And and you know, the green revolution is is on tech. I, I believe in technology technological solutions. I I think the scientific method has given us many good things, but it, it, it's easy to. Um, you know, I, I don't see a lot of people stepping for technical people stepping forward. And as you're saying, the technical people understand what's going on. I don't see a lot of technical people stepping forward and saying, wait a second, that doesn't do exactly what, what is being sold as it does, as doing it. You know, the PR is not accurate. I see very few in, in the in the blockchain world, you didn't see any famous computer scientists or cryptographers saying blockchain is going to solve the world's problems. The hype was saying that. None of the technical people were saying that. In the AI space, the hype is saying it's going to change the whole world. We don't see a lot of a lot of people who are experts in technology coming forward and say, "Well, you know, it's good technology, but it 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 has we have to think through carefully how to use it in a in a positive way for society." That instead, we see a lot of technical people saying kind of the opposite that it could take off and you know become um, become a super intelligence um, on its own. I yeah. So I don't know. I'm a little I'm a little pessimistic. I, I agree. I I hope. I think. The solution to bad science is good science. It's not giving up on science, but um, I don't see a lot of the, th that good commentary happening today. I see the opposite. It could also be the people you're looking at, because there are also people who are yes. like Emily yes. Bender, for example, and the, there's a whole group of people yes. who are also coming out and saying, okay, this is not doing this as you expect. It's not working the way we expect. Basically Absolutely. debunking some of the myths of, of AI Tim, and and I, Tim I understand, Gabriel. yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, Timmy Gabriel. Anything she says or writes, I will love to read and to listen to. She's she's brilliant and has really deep understanding of this. So there are definitely are experts who are talking. You, you're right. I, I want to jump back in though and say that I mean I studied philosophy of science for a long time, over a year, and if we go back to the falsification principle of Karl Popper, right? He says we must first try, before we accept a hypothesis, we must go out of our way to prove it false. You know, all swans are white, we get one black swan, that principle's overthrown. What I see within academia and the pursuit of science generally is that we all keep on chasing off the positive results. There isn't um, negative results are not considered publication worthy, which is silly because surely that's as important. In fact, because if, you know, I mean, how many people go down the same road to try and prove something? And if somebody had just written that one paper or had it published, there might be a whole lot of academic effort not, not wasted. But so we've become fixated on this concept of we have to have a positive result. Um, that is very true. 
And that isn't true science. I mean, true science is you actually try and say, maybe it's not as good as it says it is. And that means that you go with the Popperian approach, which is let's see if we can falsify it. Let's see if maybe it doesn't adhere to being contextual, inclusive, just, equitable, et cetera. And, and, um, and therefore, I see that, you know, and again, your companies that are harping it, they're not interested in, in science, they're interested in profit. And, but they claim to be scientific because science and technology gets you more money. You know, if you've, if you've got this big grand technological solution, then, you know, sure. So I think, I think that is to me one of the dilemmas that we, we also have a, an incomplete idea of what science is. I can understand where you're coming from because personally I've also experienced the the pressure to come up with positive results and come up with something positive. I mean, even just to get into some of the top conferences, you know, there's already this this separation now, right? Oh, these are the top conferences. These are not the top conference. If you're in the top conference and you're something special, if you're not there, then who knows what you're doing and it impacts things. And you have graduate students and, you know, students who are really, you know, they're already, you, you enter the academic field and if you're not careful, you're just already in the pressure cycle because you're trying to get papers or you can get some job, begin a faculty position. So it just keeps pushing you in this rat race and trying to get into top conferences, trying to publish top results until you probably you become a prof or something and then say, okay, I don't want this. Let me now try and do something. So yeah, I, I understand that part. The, the silver lining there is that slowly there are efforts to create platforms for the other results. So there's a workshop, I think, I, I saw it once at EMNL people two years ago, which is just purely about negative results. So just come and put and publish your negative result. What didn't work? We, we have lots of many workshops now sprout and you have Africa NLP workshops where African researchers, they're doing works that are not considered top for the top companies to publish. I mean, the whole, the whole aim of science is to publish and share your results. So I think there's some silver line in there, but I completely see your point in, in that respect. Yeah. And okay, so we, we spent some time talking about this side of AI. I have one last question for you. The, the whole discussion is an eye opener to a lot of things about AI that are not physically, um, you know, they're not sort of marketed. You know, we're all seeing the harms of AI, the, the energy costs to AI, the environmental costs, the, the hype and the, its effect, its effect on, the, on different things. My question is, from your lens, so Catherine and Jonathan, what would this thing that people call AI, what would it look like? I feel like Jonathan will start by giving it a new name, not calling it AI, but something else, which which also works. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I you know, I, I like giving new names to things. I think, um, I, uh, I mean, I, I think Catherine keeps coming back to the these um, principles that this group of interested folks working with the Creative Commons sort of outlined principles for better sharing. I mean, I we are both people who are very active in the in open education in the Creative Commons community. We believe in sharing. I you know, basically everything I write these days, I just put on my webpage with an open license on it because I just feel like I want to share everything as software to articles and things. And I I think. I believe fundamentally the world is, you know, for example, the Creative Commons has been doing a lot of work lately um, in open science. And there's a Cable Green is a wonderful person who works at Creative, of Creative, with Creative Commons, and he has worked on open science. Lately, and he has a very convincing speech. You know, the world is there are problems that are facing the human race today. You know, there are, there are human problems, there are environmental problems, there are, you know, diseases, pandemics come up, there are, you know, there are environmental damage, there are things that we need to deal with. And surely the best way for us to deal with this is to come together and to share what we all know and for everyone to contribute what they know and their abilities and their knowledge and their ideas. And so I think I, I, I think I believe in that as it's almost kind of a religious principle for me, you know, that it, there's no way of explaining it. I just think sharing is likely to be better. And I think so, you know, ain't or, or a positive version of our artificial intelligence would be one where, where this new statistical tool, which 
I mean, let's face it, it makes pretty pictures. It makes text that looks pretty surprisingly good. It's not as good maybe as it's marketed, but it's it's pretty interesting. And I, I think a world in which we came together and we were thoughtful and thought about the negative consequences and, and made a ba rational balancing of pros and cons and figure out how to make this um, benefit people You know, as as you were mentioning before, you're preserving cultures that are in danger because of economic pressures and social pressures and military pressures and environmental pressures. You know that those are valuable things. And and um, you know, the uh, a colleague of ours at Creative Commons, Jenrin Wetzler, is her name, uh, often speaks about the benefits of AI, and she mentions that there have been some nice. Um, br drug discoveries, big pharmaceutical companies who've used large language model type approaches to predict the three-dimensional structures of proteins, which is very important in drug design. If you can find another chemical that fits together with one that, that can help you cure diseases. I, I, I think those are beautiful applications. If we can come together to make them make them benefit humanity that's a great thing of course she, the example she gives is one where big pharma is doing this and big pharma is not famous for really actually working hard for the benefit of humanity they seem to work hard for the benefit of their stock value and accidentally maybe people get benefit medical benefit out of it so i i think we need to i like your optimism about science and the sign and Kat, catherine's points about the structure of science is needs to be thought through i think we need to try to follow through on them in a thoughtful way and in a open way. The transparency is such a good, is such a good way to, to make these problems go away. If these people, you know, if, if people would, you know, for example, all these con legal concerns, I'm a little obsessed with intellectual property law in the last decade of my life, you know, if they would just publish what exactly is the list of their training data, you know, that would be really interesting. We could, we could learn a lot from, you know, is this thing in their training data? Then maybe I could, you know, and, but these for-profit companies will never do that. So anyway, I think that's, um, openness is a, is a great thing I would like to see more of. My, okay. So I'm going to come with a, it's, it's complimentary tech. Um, uh, honestly, the most challenging problems that are facing us are not going to be solved by AI. They can be uh, useful, as Jonathan indicated. And the interesting thing was that the one research paper I came or research I came across with that whole 3D was that they were actually giving humans bits of, of molecules or whatever to look at. I mean, it might be a totally different application, but it just meant that at the end of the day, the people who are looking at interesting kind of conjunctions turn out, but, but what they were presented was a lot of different models. And I feel that, you know, your creativity and your capacity to predict the future by, what's it, I think Esther Dyson talks about predicting the future by inventing it. Those kind of step changes are uniquely human. And often when two or more humans get together, I'm with Jonathan. I think the LLM's capacity to translate so quickly and so well, you know, regardless of nuance or whatever, has enabled us to talk across the world. And there is this capacity to bring more people in. So from a kind of a, a more so or a, serving the greater good can be enhanced through all of these various techniques. But at the end of the day, I do believe that it's human ingenuity that will make that possible. And one of our real concerns is that, you know, your use case for AI is simply to not pay people very well or try and write them out of the equation. And that for me is, is problematic. I mean, if everybody maybe got a universal basic income, we'd be in a different kind of world. Uh, but I, my, my feeling is that I see it as a useful tool and I see it as a tool that should be deployed, albeit carefully. And I, I, honestly, I think that the people who are going to start shutting it down are the Googles and Amazons of the world. I mean, Amazon has now meant that only an author can only upload three books, three unique books a day. I mean, come on, what author can produce three books a day? I mean, hello. Um, and uh, so I see that actually your the the turning off of the taps is going to be by those big companies just because they themselves realize that there's just direct coming into the search results, direct coming into you know the books that they publish or the you know self publish or whatever. Um, but that to the extent that it can um, enable and particularly humans to communicate between countries and 
uh, languages uh, to come together to solve these large and challenging problems, that would be that would be a very good use case. For me, and I think it also draws from the things that both of you said. So um, to explain my point, th there was this, um, there was this, um, there was this talk, and in the talk, it was about sort of demystifying AI or showing the other side of AI that we're not used to. And it was there was this, uh, this um, like a meme picture where there's people were watching this fanciful robots, like, hey, look at me, I'm doing this great thing, and behind the robot so like there was like a stand the robot was on a stand there was a human hiding under there and was tweaking the robot so i think for me what ai would look like which draws on what what a few said is where the mystery and the hype goes down and the people behind the ai come to light and more i think that draws on transparency right if you're sh showing this your model as this amazing thing without explaining the training data, the people who made the training data, the energy costs, the environmental impact. You're just creating this illusion that helps you profit for profitability, but you're not showing the people behind the thing. I mean, a lot of the AI that we build to replace people, the data was made possible by the same people that we're trying to replace. And most of the things we're building to replace them we're not really asking them if this is what they want, if this is the real issue that they have. Most times the issue they have is something else that that that, that needs to be automated. And there are a few good startups or companies that are trying to approach AI from the point of view of figuring out the problem with the people and then finding the solution rather than just wrapping AI on that thing. So there's some few good things here and there, a few good spikes. But I, I, I want to see more of the people behind the AI coming, being brought front and center versus the, just the shrouded mystery. And hopefully I think we might get there because for Jonathan, to your point about coming together and sharing, while we have closed source companies like OpenAI, we have a ton of open source models. So like Hugging Face is like a repository for open source models from different companies, NASA, even big farmers, just open sourcing the stuff. The, the Transformers was from researchers at Google and, and the PyTorch, which is like the framework for lots of the work. I think it's for Meta. So there are a few good things happen in terms of sharing i think that's something that and i think that's something the research community is heavily like putting the the feet down and saying they must be sharing we need to share the 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 the, the models and the code that we we're using and thinking things through i think this is something hopefully we'll get to see more and more of that happening and through such platforms and talking with you and probably having more more discussions it, there would be more thinking it's true when it comes to AI or ain't. Um, yeah, so I think I, I'm probably too optimistic compared to Jonathan, but I think there are a few good things coming up. That's a really nice perspective. I think, you know, I was sort of making some kind of generalization about transparency being important. And the example I gave was on training data, but your point that it's really the people involved that we need to bring them forward. I think is a really that's that's sort of what Catherine was also implement, you know, pointing towards. It's about humans. It's about human solving problems, and so bringing the bringing that forward is a really good way to do to bring transparency. It's a much better example of the benefits of transparency than than the one I gave. And I, as for the optimism, I don't, you know. Time will tell. You're right. There's all, you know, I mean, the 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 open sourcing done being done by for profit entities. You know, the a weird fact is the modern world runs on open source software, right? You know, you, despite the triumph of really aggressive modern capitalism, a very extractive version of capitalism. Nevertheless, the internet runs on open source software. You know, the great majority of servers and blow on run could not exist without open source software. So, those I think companies do know that. The question is. There exists in the strange sort of tension between I want to extract only, but I also I'm using something that has a GPL license, so I better share my update. You know, it's it's a kind of weird tension we all live in under at the same time. And so I think it's it's a good point to to maybe some optimism is warranted as well. I think I I 
You've given me some optimism. I, I go up and down from day to day. I, I, I appreciate you giving me some optimism about some of these things. I think one of our questions really is, I mean, we're in late capital. Marx, for all of his faults um, in terms of communism, was extraordinary in terms of being able to predict the perils of late capital. Um, and yet at the same time, we see that, for instance, I think it was a while ago with, with Linux, they realized that nobody was actually funding um, any more that grand enterprise. And then, you know, as you say, if people are using it and then there was a flaw that was found and now suddenly they're all having to go and say, well, actually, we need to support this because we we rely on it so thoroughly. And I think part of the question that we're really seeing worldwide is that, you know, when you're when you get to the stage where you've got this enormous forget global north and global south, you've got this enormous concentration of money in very, very few hands. And then at the impoverishment of the masses, one one knows that there has to be some kind of a change and a reconciliation. Um and where you're purely you know, it's just it's just unsustainable. It's it's just economically unsustainable. Um, and I don't quite know how that will work, but certainly at the moment, all of our huge companies are just behaving like, you know, capitalism gone riot. Um, and the question would be what mode will will come in and and adjust it. Will it just be an adjustment like the, you know, that no longer will islands be allowed to give, you know, that people pay zero tax? I mean, even islands now charging Facebook and the rest 15%. Section 230 is being looked at, you know, the US law in terms of, you know, that the companies can abrogate responsibility. I was merely a transactional platform. I don't need to care about whether or not the the driver of the the taxi driver or not taxi driver, I won't mention anyone. I mean, we've had murders where people have, you know, in South Africa where the driver has, um, and yet there's been no responsibility. So I do see that, that worldwide there's got to be a shift. And maybe that is because for me, the paradigm isn't really science versus non-science. The paradigm for me is that at the end of the day, as we've always said, it's this, this, this capital. It's it's capital that's determining, and because they have power, they're determining what happens in the world, um, and how do we? And yet, I think at the same time we see an enormous distrust, an enormous distrust of big pharma, and so on. Maybe it ends up having sort of certain right wing politicians come to power, but I think that there is a there is a a, a, a shift, and um and I and I think that for me is. I'm I'm an eternal optimist. I think that humans are inherently political. Apparently, most of our brain is political, and that we will come to solutions from that perspective. Maybe not necessarily as scientists, but as politicians, because um, we're all politicians in our own in our own sort of small communities. So maybe the answer is political. Mm, that's very interesting. We went from AI to politics. That's a political framework of AI. But I, I do see your point in, in, in the idea of the political framework, as I put it, because, and, and to Jonathan, you know, you said you, you have a lot of the researchers and technologists working on the stuff, but they're not the ones who are marketing and showing the branding, the work. And and I've also heard some, some um you know, there's this drive to try and get more of the researchers and technologies into the startups or into these organizations that are building at the forefront of, of these, some of these um, technologies. So yeah, it's really about, to your point about Jonathan, it's bringing the people who are involved in making the technology. And for me, bringing the people who will be impacted by the technology, so that's the community and the, the data community all together and then to your point uh, Catherine I think I like the political framework because it shows that it's not an easy problem it's not something that okay the solution is just this or just that it's really something that requires weighing everything you know you have capital to think about because a lot of the a lot of the the four good ideas that we have are not profitable and non-profitable means it's going to be hard to get capital and without capital you cannot sustain it and without sustaining you cannot have lasting impact so it's indeed 
political in the sense that you need to figure out how to balance some of the the goals, the, the social good goals you have with the realities of, of the world and how everything is run on capital. I think it's a, it's part, it's a major reason why I, because I, I come from a purely scientific background with mathematics and, and machine learning, but over time I've seen myself delving into other things like management and discussing with the non-scientific aspects of people because I've I've grown to see that you actually need these different sectors it's not just purely saying let me just build my model and come up with the next best algorithm you have to think about the impact in the community you have to think about the politics and think about capital and, and these other things so yeah with that, it's been really, really wonderful talking to the two of you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been really, really amazing. What are some of the things that you look forward to this 2024? Or things that you either things you're working on or things you're just excited about? Well, actually, I'm I think one of the things I'm interesting, I, I'm always talking when I'm talking to people about AI, about how, you know, the transformer architecture and generalized pre-trained transformers and the way we build neural network solutions to problems is really beautiful. It's an interesting method, way of building a statistical model, but I feel like we don't understand it the way we understand statistical models that existed a few years ago. And I think there's good research happening today and in various places, um, mostly in academia. You know, I, I want to understand, you know, when I do a thing like a regression model or something with traditional statistical methods, I know how the data changes in the data are going to affect the outcome of the model. I know those things very well. And I feel like we don't know that. I think so I'm I'm very optimistic that this science will get better and we will understand in some, you know, professionals will understand this technology better and better. I think that that'll be exciting. We'll we'll know things like you know, oh, you see these things like people who are afraid, concerned about having their work stolen. There's this now this poisoning technique. You can put images into training data sets that poison the model. It will not make exact copies of your art um, as, as outputs. And I think that's the kind of thing, you know, if it were a regression model, we know how to put data points in to make the output, to change the output of a model. And I think a deeper understanding of this will give us practical, uh, happen with like practical things that we can do with it. And, and I think it will give us also, people who are more, who not only interested in the programming, yeah, give us a pretty, a pretty theory. Which I so I'm, I'm optimistic that the theory is moving very quickly, and that will be interesting. I'm um, I'm inherently optimistic about people, and I believe that um, your from a UNESCO perspective, the recommendations on open science, on open education, on open resources is going to open up a lot for the world, for people to understand more. I mean, people are inherently playful and problem solving. Um, and if they are given the, the tools, the techniques, the data, the information, I mean, within reason, I mean, one also cannot have them barricaded in slave barracks or whatever, but that humans are inherently drive to solve problems. And I believe, I mean, if we look, I mean, not that long ago, they were predicting that, you know, London would be, you know, unable to deal with all the horse muck that was being produced by the horses, the, the, the carriages, and then you got gas, electricity. So I, I have a very strong and inherent uh, belief in humans' capacity to solve problems. Um, including the challenges of AI. I mean, there's always, all, uh, you know, the moment you create, um, you know, this lock or it, there's always, you know, creating encryption, decrypting encryption, to create, you know, there's, there's always that. Uh, the moment somebody's come up with a solution, somebody else comes up with a, as you're talking, a poisoning. So um, we're in an interesting time in South Africa. We're coming up for elections on the 29th of May. It's predicted the ANC will lose its majority for the first time since uh, the since 1994. Um, and I just think that those are all very exciting things. I mean, it's uh, it's my father always said it's a bad day when you don't learn something new. And every day is a good day if you do learn something new. And I think that humans are actually, you know, the internet has really been quite transformative. It's also been addictive, but it's been re remarkably transformative in AI. And I think that we, out, out of all of the stress, we can 
find gold, but we do have to be careful to label what is dross from what is gold. That was very powerful. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. It's been a wonderful episode with you both. I'm very, very excited that we had this conversation. Definitely. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Thank you for listening. Subscribe to our channel for more episodes. Have a wonderful day and bye.